When the stock market plunges like it did this past week, everyone pays attention. But short-term losses aren't that important to the man you're about to meet. David Walker thinks the biggest economic peril facing the nation is being ignored. And for this past year, he's been traveling the country like an Old Testament prophet, urging people to wake up before it's too late. Who is David Walker and why should we care? He's the nation's top accountant, the Comptroller General of the United States. He's totaled up the government's income, liabilities, and future obligations, and concluded that our current standard of living is unsustainable unless some drastic action is taken, and he's not alone. It's been called the dirty little secret everyone in Washington knows, a set of financial truths so inconvenient that most elected officials don't even want to talk about them, which is exactly why David Walker does. I would argue that the most serious threat to the United States is not someone hiding in a cave in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but our own fiscal irresponsibility. David Walker is a prudent man and a highly respected public official. Who sent you this uh, draft document? As Comptroller General of the United States, he runs the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, which audits the government's books and serves as the investigative arm of the U.S. Congress. He has more than 3,000 employees, a budget of a half a billion dollars, and a message he considers urgent. I'm going to show you some numbers. They're all big and they're all bad. So bad that Walker has given up on elected officials and taken his message directly to taxpayers and opinion makers. Dave Walker, how are you? Good to see you. Hoping to shape the debate in the next presidential election. You know, the American people, I tell you, we've been to 13 cities outside of Washington this fiscal wake-up tour. They are absolutely starved for two things, the truth and leadership. He calls it a fiscal wake-up tour, and he is telling civic groups, university forums, and newspaper editorial boards that the U.S. has spent, promised, and borrowed itself into such a deep hole, it will be unable to climb out if it doesn't act now. As Walker sees it, the survival of the republic is at stake. Uh, what's going on right now is that we're spending more money than we make, we're charging it to a credit card, and expecting our grandchildren to pay for it. And that's absolutely outrageous. You've heard this before from Ross Perot 15 years ago. In 1950, when the dollar was worth a dollar? You might have even thought the problem had been solved. Tonight I come before you to announce that the federal deficit will be simply zero. Well, those days are gone. We've gone from surpluses to huge deficits, and our long-range situation is much worse. President Bush would argue that the economy is in pretty good shape. Unemployment is down. The deficit uh, is actually less than expected. The fact is, is that we don't face an immediate crisis. And so people say, what's the problem? The answer is, we suffer from a fiscal cancer. It is growing within us, and if we do not treat it, it could have catastrophic consequences for our country. The cancer, Walker says, are massive entitlement programs we can no longer afford, exacerbated by a demographic glitch that began more than 60 years ago. A dramatic spike in the fertility rate called the baby boom. Beginning next year and for 20 years thereafter, 78 million Americans will become pensioners and medical dependents of the U.S. taxpayer. The first baby boomer will reach 62 and be eligible for early retirement or Social Security January 1, 2008. They'll be eligible for Medicare just three years later. And when those boomers start retiring in mass, then that will be a tsunami of spending that could swamp our ship of state if we don't get serious. To illustrate their impact, he uses a PowerPoint presentation to show what would happen in 30 years if the U.S. maintains its current course and fulfills all the promises politicians have made to the public on things like Social Security and Medicare. What happens in 2040 Well, if nothing changes? If nothing changes, the federal government's not going to be able to do much more than pay interest on the mounting debt and some entitlement benefits. It won't have money left for anything else, national defense, homeland security, education, you name it. Walker says you could eliminate all waste and fraud and the entire Pentagon budget and the long-range financial projections barely change in what's shaping up as an actuarial nightmare. 
there's not going to be enough wage earners to pay for the benefits of the baby boomers. That's part of the problem. But the real problem, Steve, is health care cost. Our health care problem is much more significant than Social Security. What do you mean by that? By that I mean that the Medicare problem is five times greater than the Social Security problem. The problem with Medicare, Walker says, is people keep living longer and medical costs keep rising at twice the rate of inflation. But instead of dealing with the problem, he says the president and the Congress made things much worse just three years ago when they expanded the Medicare program to include prescription drug coverage. The prescription drug bill was probably the most fiscally irresponsible piece of legislation since the 1960s. The Why? imbalance, well, because we promised way more that we can afford to keep. Eight trillion dollars added to what was already a 15 to 20 trillion dollar underfunding. We're not being realistic. We can't afford the promises we've already made, much less to be able to piling on top of them. With one stroke of the pen, Walker says the federal government increased existing Medicare obligations nearly 40 percent over the next 75 years. We'd have to have eight trillion dollars today invested at treasury rates to deliver on that promise. And how much do we have? Zip. <laughs> so where's that money going to come from? Well, it's going to come from additional taxes, or it's going to come from restructuring these promises, or it's going to come from, uh, from cutting other spending. He's not suggesting that the nation do away with Medicare or prescription drug benefits. He does believe the current health care system is way too expensive and overrated. On cost, we're number one in the world. We spend 50 percent more of our economy on health care than any nation on earth. And we have a huge percentage of the population that's not covered. We have the largest uninsured population of any major industrialized nation. We have above average infant mortality, below average life expectancy, and much higher than average medical error rates for an industrialized nation. Walker says we have promised almost unlimited health care to senior citizens who never see the bills, and the government is already borrowing money to pay them. He says the system is unsustainable. It's the number one fiscal challenge for the federal government. It's the number one fiscal challenge for state governments, and it's the number one competitiveness challenge for American business. We're going to have to dramatically and fundamentally reform our health care system in installments over the next 20 years. And if we don't? And if we don't, it could bankrupt America. You're probably expecting to hear from someone who disagrees with the Comptroller General's numbers, projections, and analysis. But hardly anyone does. He is accompanied on the Wake Up Tour by economists from the Conservative Heritage Foundation, the left-leaning Brookings Institution, and the nonpartisan Concord Coalition. Let's go. The only dissenters seem to be a small minority of economists who believe either that the U.S. can grow its way out of the problem or that Walker is overstating it. The Wall Street Journal, for example, calls you Chicken Little, running around saying that the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Unfortunately, they don't get it. I don't know anybody who has done their homework, has researched history, and who's good at math who would tell you that we can grow our way out of this problem. Economic growth alone is unlikely to solve the nation's impending fiscal problems. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke validated much of Walker's take on the situation at congressional hearings this year and so did ranking Republicans and Democrats on the Senate Budget Committee. Senator Kent Conrad of North Dakota is the chairman. What do you think about David Walker and what he's doing? I think David Walker is providing an enormous public service. Do you agree with his uh, figures and his projections? I do. You know, I mean, we could always question the precise nature of this projection or that projection, but that misses the point. The larger story that he is telling is exactly correct. Are most people in Washington aware of how bad it is? Yes. They know in large measure here, Republicans and Democrats, that we are on a course that doesn't add up. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? Because it's always easier not to. Because it's always easier to defer, to kick the can down the road, to avoid making choices. You know, you get in trouble in politics when you make choices. Do you think taxes ought to be raised? I believe, first of all, we need more revenue, we need to be tough on spending, and we need to reform the entitlement programs. We need to do all of it. 
You think there's a consensus for that? No. <laughs> I don't. Any politician who tells you that we can solve our problem without reforming Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is not telling you the truth. Over the next year, the nation's top accountant will be taking his wake-up tour to the early primary states, telling voters that we need to begin raising taxes or government revenues and put a cap on federal spending if we want to maintain our economic security and current standard of living. The longer that we wait, the more we risk a financial crisis. If you tell them the truth, if you give them the facts, if you explain this in terms of not just numbers, but values and people, uh, they will get it and empower their elected officials to make tough choices. Do you know any politicians that want to raise taxes or cut back benefits? I don't know politicians that like to raise taxes. I don't know politicians that like to cut spending. But I think what we have to recognize is this is not just about numbers. We are mortgaging the future of our children and grandchildren at record rates. And that is not only an issue of fiscal irresponsibility, it's an issue of immorality.